even though there's a tremendous amount of work to, it takes to put an event of this size together, it is just a joy to be here and to be together. Last night at the communion service, there was just such a remarkable sense of wholeness. We're, we're here together. And I really want to say to you, I know there are a number of people who were not here last night who were here this morning. I'm very glad that you are here this morning, but I want to say you missed it if you weren't here last night, um, both in terms of the extraordinary level of what we received musically as well as the very fine sermon from Ken and Russell, um, as well as actually one of our first votes that, you know, if everyone had come, it actually might have changed the outcome because uh, there were enough people who were not here that are here now that could have shifted the election. So this is where we trust God, right? Um, but it's grateful for us to be together. If I could have the first slide for the address itself on the screen. Here we go. This is the collect from last Sunday. Uh, if we could please pray this together. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. If there is a collect in the entire prayer book, that connects so directly with the theme of this event, light of the world, salt of the earth. It is, in fact, this collect, because number one, it states as fact, in the same way as you are the light of the world, that God would give us what we need to be, in fact, that light, shining with the radiance of Christ's glory. That's what happens to the people of God as they enter into worship, as they hear and ponder God's word together. I mean, think about it for a moment. As we read the Bible, as we listen to the scriptures being read, God is in that moment releasing the light of his presence. Whether we feel it or not, actually, it's really quite beside the point. Point: The word of God does not return void. And so that when the word of God is read, something is released. The very presence of God is, in fact, released because of the power that that word has that naturally, supernaturally touches the inner life that God has implanted in the life of the believer. There's a kind of inhale, exhale that happens as the word begins to not just be read, but imparted because that's the work that the Holy Spirit does. And the same as we receive the sacraments. I know that they are, if your experience is similar to mine, when I come up to receive the Eucharist, for example, sometimes it is a personal, emotional, often, encounter with the living God. Other times, nothing. Right? Are you there? I mean, I go through it, and I do it as an act of faith. But as a personal experience, besides the receiving of the bread and wine itself, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, Paul on the road to Damascus. But again, God promises to feed us a different analogy with his very presence as we receive the bread and the wine. And so there, too, the radiance of Christ's glory is being imparted to us, both in the reading of scripture as well as the receiving of the sacraments. And out of that, God works in us that which we need to be able to step forward in what it is that he has already given us as men and women who are, in fact, by his declaration, because he, what he has worked in us, light of the world. You see, Christ, as Canon Russell reminded us last night, is also the light of the world. And because we are in Christ, God pours that same light, the light of Christ, into us so that God might use us as a light to draw other people to Christ. In other words, it's not just something that we are receiving 
by virtue of who we are as members of his body. And who is Jesus? He is the one who's out there. God is the one leading the mission, you see. And so as we are saying yes to him and receiving what it is that he gives us, it is his intention that we not only receive, but be a channel, a, ves a vessel. So we receive, in fact, the magnificent gift of the light of Christ, and in receiving that gift, we also receive our own vocational calling. God pouring the light of Christ within us so that we can live both individually and together as communities of believers in a way that Christ Jesus may be known, worshiped, and obeyed. That is what allows, in essence, us to be light of the world, salt of the earth. I have to tell you, when we contemplate, or at least when I do, even briefly, the idea that Jesus calls this gathering of poor sinners that we are, the light of the world, literally, the light of the cosmos, salt of the earth, I find it absolutely staggering. It seems impossible, quite frankly, too big to even imagine, and yet Jesus states this as fact, not as mere hope. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. God is pouring his light in us and is also pouring his light through us into the world. And while I certainly cannot comprehend the fullness of its meaning, I would like to offer some brief implications. Because, just, because when you really say, like in the very depths of who you are, God has made us the light of the world. I don't know, my back straightens up. I feel like there's a dignity, there is a purpose about this. There is in fact a life's work in it. And it does in fact empower. Because you see, as people who have received the light of Christ and are a channel for that light, we don't need to be afraid. What does it say in Psalm 27? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Because as Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the answer, of whom shall I be afraid, is no one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as people who have received that light of Christ, we can trust that God will not only empower us, but also guide us each step of the way. Because Jesus promises in John 8, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. You see, what does it say in the 23rd Psalm? He leads me along right pathways for his namesake, even in the valley of the shadow of death. So not only is the light of Christ that which empowers me, it is also operates, as it were, like a kind of halogen beam that gives me the capacity to take one step at a time, trusting that no matter what's going on in my circumstances, God is working things for the good. He is empowering me with what I need to be able to meet even the most difficult of challenges. In other words, the promise of his guidance is not at all a promise to be free from hardship. In fact, it fact might actually might lead us into hardship for the sake of the gospel, and yet we will not walk in darkness. And as people who have received the light of Christ, that light, as I said, brings with us all that we need to fulfill the vocational calling of let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, in our day and age, what I believe many in the world are longing for are men and women who are willing to act with that kind of dignity, that kind of confidence, that kind of poise, even in the face of uncertainty, even in the face of great hardship. So that no matter what it is that we endure, we trust that God will never let us go. We trust that he is holding us in the palm of his hand. He gives us what we need to even face the worst of challenges, knowing that even when we feel nothing, we can still say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is exactly that kind of witness among family, friends, neighbors, enemies, 
co-workers, that in the midst of actually the difficulties of life, God gives us the capacity to pray, to reach out in need, and to walk with a sense of his possessing us that allows us to serve the world in that way. Because I believe in this day and age, to be the light of the world means to be a servant church. People who are willing to go out of their way to make a difference in the lives of other people. You, you see, as you well know, the caricature of who we are in the media is that we're basically slightly mentally deranged seriously dangerous, members of the Flat Earth Society, perhaps even financial swindlers or sexual predators, and for us to begin to actually be a witness among people who do not know Christ. We have the challenge of, in some ways, getting on the other side of whatever caricature they have of people who call themselves believers in Jesus. And more often than not, the way that happens in being us is that we step out of our way. We choose to show up to make a difference even if they are people that we do not know because God gives us the capacity to look beyond our own self-preoccupation and to see the need. You see, the calling to be salt and light is the opportunity that God gives us to make a difference in this profoundly hurting community. That calling to be the light and salt came to us not long ago through Hurricane Dorian. Hurricane Dorian has been called the worst natural disaster in the history of the Bahamas. One of the most powerful hurricanes recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. And when the storm struck, people flew into action, some of them literally catching the last few flights to Grand Bahama Island so that they could be available to be there and serve. Most Central Floridians know what it is to live through a hurricane, right? And out of that, funds began to pour in, gifts large and small, including a $10,000 anonymous gift from someone at Holy Trinity Episcopal Academy. It was not limited by a long shot to our churches. The money we received and was and continues to be sent directly to the Anglican Diocese of the Bahamas. As of this week, we're still getting funds. The total is over $264,000 easily one of the largest offerings to an emergency relief effort in our diocese history. And that total does not include the direct involvement of numerous individuals and congregations in the re relief effort. I could take a long time giving you examples, but I mean a lot of people have helped out. The Bishop of the Bahamas and Turks and Caico Islands, the Reverend Leish Boyd, has expressed his sincerest gratitude. He is aware and knows of our prayers. He continues to send me very detailed reports of almost unimaginable damage, including some of the photographs you see on the screen. At this point, the rebuilding has begun in earnest. Everyone who needed to be evacuated to the various islands has done so. In fact, whole congregations have relocated, like from one of the islands in the, Bahab the Abacos that was hit the hardest, to Grand Bahama Island, and the priest actually serves his parishioners who were in the Abacos in Grand Bahama Island. Emergency food distribution is ongoing, and Bishop Boyd continues to relay his sincerest and tremendous gratitude. As true with Hurricane Dorian, servanthood does, you see, mean financial generosity. I, I was talking to a priest at dinner last night who was in some ways complaining about the fact that he has a parishioner, even a vestry member, who gives almost nothing to the budget, but ra ya yells the loudest about wanting to make sure where that money goes. Y you see, it doesn't work that way. Um, servanthood means financial generosity. And with our own, within our own diocese, God honestly has blessed us financially. Though God does not always meet our wants, he does provide for our needs. And 2019 was no exception. As you will see later when the budget is presented, God has blessed our diocese ending the fiscal year with a $50,000 surplus. And a balanced budget for 2020 was passed by the diocesan board with no deficit needing to be made up for out of invested returns. That's, that's actually been a long time since that's happened. 
A balanced budget is the result of several important factors. First of all, of course, is God, who promises to provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. But the second is the remarkable sense of fellowship and com camaraderie that we share here. We understand in a way that just continues to grow in its impact that we are on mission together. And then the third is the generosity of our congregations. All of us in the diocese owe you congregations who give your assessment a tremendous, really, word of appreciation. But you see, there continues to be this growing sense of shared financial responsibility. We are not in it for ourselves. The point of our budget is not to just pay the light bill. The point is to have the kind of capacity to release new people into ministry, to inspire new opportunities for service, to continue to build overseas relationships with our sisters and brothers and the rest of the Anglican communion. In other words, God help us if our budget is merely maintenance. It's bigger than that, far bigger than that. I mean, I'm happy to give my own tithes and offerings and those of our family to make sure the staff gets paid that things happen in, the way, in a way that actually feels like it's orderly and people are taken care of. But the real point is, again, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. And that is, in fact, meant to be reflected in even, and in fact, perhaps even more importantly, in our financial documents. And this, I think, is beginning to catch fire in a way that, for me, is just tremendously exciting. And this is demonstrated by the trend upward in our congregational giving and a trust that we have in those who manage our finances. In fact, we have a superb financial commission, a strong diocesan board, and an outstanding chief financial officer in Earl Pickett, all of whom, oh, I know. All of whom contribute to a mutual sense of not only financial responsibility, but also shared financial integrity. There is nothing that will drive away donors in your congregations if they don't trust where the money goes. They have to believe that you see it as a steward from God who has given you these things for the management of his priorities to be expressed within the financial life of a church. And I'm grateful for the leaders who do that. Last year marked a major milestone in the history of our diocese, our 50th anniversary. When we first envisioned celebrating this anniversary as a diocese, we wanted to again do something that would actually serve our community. And from that vision, 2019 started out with an, in fact, an unprecedented event. The Diocese of Central Florida hosted the largest gathering of Episcopalians in the history of the state of Florida. That's enormous. Um, the prayers, yeah, you did this. The prayers and a volunteer force of several hundred opened the doors at the First Baptist Church of Orlando to over 4,000 people to attend the Say Yes to Jesus revival. Many watched it also live stream around the diocese. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, preached a powerful sermon, and God used that event to touch scores of people with the gospel. Remember, we had prayer teams all over that auditorium, and as soon as that began to happen, people just began to come forward for prayer. It wasn't just the fact that we did something to feel good about ourselves, although that sure happened. It also was, it made a remarkable eternal impact on the lives of, including the people at First Baptist themselves who were stunned that Episcopalians would even do such a thing. <laughs> it was not only the largest gathering of Episcopalians in the history of the state of Florida, it was also the largest of all of the revivals that the presiding bishop has ever conducted across the United States. And as they shared with us, our presiding bishop and his staff, our Say, Je Say Yes to Jesus revival was the very best they have ever been a part of. Over the, yeah, sure, thank you. 
Over this past year, in my role as diocesan bishop, I have participated in and 30, thoroughly enjoyed 36 Episcopal visits across the diocese, at which I confirmed 178 people, received 98 into the life of the church, and praying for 11 who renewed their baptismal vows, and that was with a three-month sabbatical. Additionally, I visited numerous churches around the diocese, serving at everything from funerals, vestry events, to parish social gatherings. I continue to serve on the board of the Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center, of which I'm a fan, by the way, and I'm a national chaplain for the Daughters of the King. P.S. If you need prayer warriors, get the daughters. One of the joys of being a bishop is in the raising up of new leadership. In 2019, there were eight celebrations of new ministry in the diocese, including Tracy Duggar, Catherine Jeffrey, Stuart Shelby, and Charles Myers, and Trey Garland, Tim Nunez, and Jeremy Bergstrom. 11 people were ordained to the priesthood, 10 in the diaconate during the past year, and this coming Monday evening, as in day after tomorrow, there will be a diocesan ordination of five additional candidates for the diaconate. Daniel Pinnell from Berkeley, California, who is at Jesus de Nazareth, going to Grace Church Ocala, Stephen Heisler, sponsoring Parish St. Gabriel's, assigned to St. Mark's Coco, Jennifer Grady, sponsoring Parish and Assignment back at St. Francis in the Fields, Louisville, Kentucky, Beth Hall, sp sponsoring Parish and Assignment, St. George in the Villages, and Joe Dewey, sponsoring Parish, Grace Church Ocala, Assignment, All Angels Episcopal Church, New York City. These ordinations have not been limited, as you just heard, to the Diocese of Central Florida. Our Canon for Vocations, Justin Holcomb, our Commission on Ministry, and our Standing Committee have been working together each year to raise up new clergy, not only in the diocese from around the country. In 2019 alone, I ordained Marcus Johnson in Geneva, Illinois, Becky Watson in College Station, Texas, Raleigh Langley, St. Francis in Louisville, Kentucky, B.J. Baracker, All Saints Chevy Chase, and Palmer Kennedy, Ascension, Lafayette, Louisiana. Our diocese is providing an invaluable service in raising up bright, thoughtful, prayerful, and gifted clergy to serve in the wider Episcopal Church, all with the permission of their diocesan bishops who are happily to, happy to receive them back. While all ordination services are an honor and a privilege, and I mean it, Two priesthood ordinations from last year stood out as particularly remarkable. The first was the ordination of Jared Jones, chaplain at the Upper School of Holy Trinity Episcopal Academy in Melbourne. In his very short time serving there as chaplain, Jared has built a network of trust among students, administrators, and faculty. And the extraordinary thing is that unchurched students start, have started coming up to Jared and asking to be baptized. They say, my family doesn't go to church. My church is our school chapel services. May I be baptized here? And it's happening. Private school parochial people, take note. So we thought it only fitting that Jared should be ordained at a school chapel service. A first for me, a wonderful event in the life of Holy Trinity Episcopal Academy, but interestingly enough, not their first ordination. A while ago, Rob Goodrich was also ordained at the chapel of Holy Trinity Episcopal Academy. I, I just want to say as a PS, and this is slightly arts off script, I love going to the schools. I love meeting with the religious service people. I love meeting with the religious studies group of students, all of whom are all kinds of different religions because we as policy open the door to anyone regardless of faith, but there are those who want to be a part of what it is that we're doing. The only stipulation we make is that if you come to our school, you do have to attend the chapel services and attend any required religious classes that we have, and most parents are absolutely fine with that. And the engagement that I have had, particularly with Hindu and Muslim students in those schools, has been nothing short of remarkable. It's really fun. I, I want you to know that I have no sense that when I'm talking in an inter-religious gathering, I have to sort of dumb the presentation down to a kind of, well, we really all believe the same thing, universalism. Just the opposite. 
It is an invitation, and what they want is for me to talk clearly about the distinctives of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. They honor that, they respect that as a position, and they want to de be in dialogue about how we are both similar and different. It is just one of the best opportunities right now. I love it. Another ordination that stood out was the ordination of the Reverend Dr. Richard Gonzalez, held at Messiah Winter Garden. Yeah, he's, yeah, thank you. <laughs> what happened, you see, was that Richard came to this country originally in 1962, emigrating with his family from Cuba. So in the providence of God, as it just so happened, the right Reverend Griselda Delgado del Carpio, Episcopal Bishop of Cuba, was making her first visit to Central Florida at the very time of Rich's ordination. So of course I invited Bishop Griselda to join me in the ordination she joyfully accepted, and to have two bishops, one from Rich's homeland and one from his now home diocese, was for Richard coming full circle. And it was another, in fact, both joyful and historic occasion, both in the Diocese of Central Florida and in the life of the Episcopal Church. I believe it is the first time that the Bishop of Cuba and any Episcopal Bishop in the United States jointly presided over an ordination. And she is amazing, by the way. Worth getting to know if you don't know her. And she'll be back. I continue to be involved in the life of the wider Episcopal Church and within the communion. I serve at the invitation of the presiding bishop on a task force called Communion Across Differences that is charged with finding a way forward in the face of our theological differences, especially as it relates to gay marriage, but other things as well. And we don't, <laughs> we don't skirt anything. And so as a result, it really can be tough slogging and some of our theological differences seem intractable, perhaps even irreconcilable, but we're working together. The very existence of this task force indicates that both in the Episcopal Church and in the communion, we are still very much a divided house over the issue of same-sex marriage. And we are committed to trying to find a way to resolve these differences, really both at the international level as well as in the Episcopal Church level. This is not a power grab on either side. Some of us have participated in listening sessions, which actually were manipulative ways to get you to think differently. That's not what we're doing. But instead, there really is a concerted effort to continue to discern, both within the Episcopal Church and the communion. Your continued prayers for this matters deeply and deeply appreciate it. I recently invite, was invited by my alma mater, Virginia Theological Seminary, to participate in a similar international consultation on the very same issues addressed by the Communion Across Difference Task Force. Bishops of various opinions, as well as some very talented theologians, not the least of which is the Reverend Dr. Catherine Sonderegger of ETS. Clergy, if you don't know her systematic, she is worth it. It is lyrical and is doxological in terms of the way she writes about her doctrine of God. She was amazing, as were many of the other presentations. Uh, I found that meeting to be refreshing because of the complete absence of both the frenetic urgency and the politically driven polemic. None of that was there that often marks our Episcopal conversations. We were seeped in prayer. We were reminded by numerous presenters how long genuine discernment actually takes in the life of the history of our church, often at least a generation. Right now, the consensus among us and the recent report from the primates gathered in Jordan is that this matter is far from settled, and in the meantime, we are willing to walk together. I want to say that so clearly because um, there is a sense among some that, well, if you, you can't really be a faithful Episcopalian and take a more conservative position on these ethical issues. And I'm here to tell you that is absolutely not true at all. And in fact, even in the House of Bishops, where I stand up and speak, as well as some of my other communion partner bishops, while some people, you know, they roll their eyes, there they go again. The real truth is, is that, that there is a wonderful sense of mutual respect that I, I, I genuinely treasure. 
Uh, someone asked me not long ago if I felt like I was under pressure. And honestly, yeah, there's pressure, but the fact of the matter is there really is grace to be able to speak with great joy about what it is that we believe and understand the scripture to teach. Moving on. Last year marked the seventh year of my episcopacy, and while this in and itself was a cause for thanksgiving, I am grateful beyond measure to have the opportunity to serve, and out of that meant that I contractually was eligible for a three-month sabbatical. Thanks to the generosity of individuals from this diocese, I was able to take that sabbatical, actually the only three-month sabbatical I have been able to take over the 40-plus years of my ordinations, and it was glorious. Laura Lee and I cannot thank you enough for making this restorative break possible. It was a time of refreshment and great fun, which included wonderful conversations with Anglican leaders in Ireland and in England. That was actually a conversation where Chris Russell and I talked. It was also wonderful for Laura Lee and I, particularly as we took almost two weeks to hike the Canterbury Trail from Winchester to Canterbury, where it was just the two of us, except of course for the wildlife we met along the way, which was, it was just wonderful. God used that time to open my heart and to change me in a way that I actually didn't expect, although I'd been praying for it, opening my heart to a new kind of silence and to discern what God was calling me to do in these next few years in my episcopacy. And the message was clear, humility, prayer, and learning to even more deeply recognize and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That happened in a very real way right after I got back in the person of Scott Holcomb. When I mentioned eight new celebrations of new ministry, I intentionally left out the installation service for Canon Scott Holcomb, or as he is known to our diocesan staff as Canon Scott Holcomb with an E, or sometimes even Scooter. His coming on diocesan staff can best be described as an answer to prayer. He is up for the challenge, gifted at multitasking, a bulldog about detail, and ready for a laugh. He crisscrosses the diocese at an alarming rate, hence the name Scooter, and manages to keep every file on each church in order. I don't know how that happens. He can be tough wonderfully kind, and always with his wife, Lenora, by his side, an amazing baker and host. One of the biggest concerns I had when I returned from my sabbatical was that who would be the next canon of the ordinary. I'd spoken to a number of highly recommended people, and there was never any green light inside regarding who that should be. You know, who, God? It wasn't until after I returned from sabbatical, had lunch with Scott, that I saw it. Scott's just telling me about where he'd been and what he'd been doing while I was away, connecting with other clergy besides the great work at St. David's. And as I listened, it was like, well, there he is. <laughs> the right guy at the right place at the right time. So, Scooter, I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you are also now on our diocesan team. One of the happy surprises of this past year was a conversation with the Right Reverend Patrick Augustine, who only de which only deepened our friendship and opened a door of opportunity here in the Diocese of Central Florida. Bishop Augustine presently serves as the Anglican in the Ang Anglican Diocese of Boer in the country of South Sudan. Remember, there are two countries now in the Sudan. Prior to being elected bishop, Father Augustine had a successful tenure, long term actually, as the rector of Christ Church in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Father Augustine had visited South Sudan off and on for decades, and the people there knew and trusted him. So it was no surprise when he was elected their bishop, although it was highly unusual for an Episcopalian to be elected a bishop in Southern Africa, and it was not without controversy, I have to add. But with the express permission of the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church and under the authority of the Anglican Archbishop of the Sudan, the election was confirmed and Bishop Augustine even now is in South Sudan. And so he sends me, in fact, if you follow Facebook, he posts something almost every day about what he's doing while he's there. 
Here is the opportunity for us. Bishop Augustine retired with full pension as a priest in the Episcopal Church. So by his own admission, I don't need any salary. I own a home in La Crosse. But the civil war in the Sudan has left southern Sudan full of charred remains of what was a thriving and mostly Christian culture. The civil war left almost all of the buildings that housed Christian ministries, schools, hospitals, relief agencies, and churches burned to the ground. Bishop Augustine has the challenge of not merely pastoring a group of people, all of whom suffer from some kind of trauma, but also rebuilding the infrastructure of a society. Because of the war, no one in Sudan has really much money to do any building for any sort of relief effort. As a, and so that's his real charge. And in fact, honestly, one of the reasons he was elected, besides the fact that they love him, is that they don't need to pay him a salary. Um, but Bishop Augustine and I came up with a plan, and this is not just limited to us. What if Bishop Augustine visited our churches over a marked period of time, officially as my guest, able to preach, celebrate, and confirm, if we were to invite him? We could privately raise the money to help his diocese in Sudan and cover his travel and lodging, because that's all he would need. He would stay annually for three months during their rainy season when they tell him, we don't want you coming because the roads are washed out. There is a high chance that he could contract malaria. And so it is really better for he and Vera, Vera, his wife, at that time to be out of the country, which would be basically what we would call, well, March, April, and May around then. Presently, there is no line item in the budget for this, but there is a lot of enthusiasm for his coming. He was here for our clergy conference and met a lot of the clergy. He has an infectious love for Jesus. He is an enthusiastic preacher and is the very definition of a spirit-filled servant. So the rector of Grace Church Ocala, Jonathan French, has volunteered to assist in private fundraising efforts to help cover the costs of his being with us three months per year. Our hope is to privately raise, for the four years left in my episcopacy, approximately 40000 per year to cover travel, as well as to send a significant chunk of that money back to his diocese. Uh, if you are interested further in being about any, in that, any of that kind of fundraising, please let either Father French or me know. Also, we're going to organize a team of people, a small group, who will be a kind of pastoral connection, both to pray for and stand with Bishop Augustine, as well as to coordinate efforts that we might make for that diocese. And um, Dan and Evelyn Smith have already volunteered to help do that. In fact, Evelyn has been bravely often on her own in Sudan on a pretty regular basis. So they know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, so if you're interested, please talk to any of them. The new year began with a bang, meaning 2020, with Pinder Palooza, <laughs> or the Pinder Extravaganza. In Thanksgiving, for 60 years of ordained service in the Episcopal Church, and particularly for his tenure at St. John the Baptist Washington Shores, from 1959 to 1995, a packed out crowd gathered at the Cathedral Church of St. Luke to thank God for quote unquote Father Pinder as he, effect, as he is affectionately called by his former parishioners and his ministry. The presiding bishop returned to our diocese to preach a mass gospel choir led us in worship. And in my comments at that service, I said anyone in Central Florida who works and believes in racial reconciliation is in his debt. He helped spare Orlando from racial violence during the civil rights movement and raised up a generation of Christian leaders who still proudly call themselves Pinder's kids. He is a true hero and still a man who loves and serves Jesus with his wife Marion with all of his heart. Um, there may never be anyone else quite like him. Turning around the bend toward the end. Lambeth 2020. 
One of the key events in the life of the Anglican Communion will be the gathering of Anglican bishops from all over the world at Canterbury Cathedral the last two weeks of July. Significant meetings are being held between now and then, including a meeting in March of our own House of Bishops and some other consultations that are taking place to prepare. In the midst of forces that in fact want us to break apart, why do we need the Anglican Communion anyway? Or from another side of the fence, you're not really Anglican. You've heard them, of course. Um, it is an extremely important gathering. Our beloved Anglican Communion, and I really mean this, is precious. And a visible unity that serves as a witness to the world that following Jesus includes everyone who desires to be his followers, regardless of race, nationality, education, or family background. While our history of colonialism has scarred us deeply in this communion, the Archbishop of Canterbury has been valiant in working tirelessly, calling us to be gracious in the face of our differences for the sake of a greater good, and that is our common witness to the world. There are those in the Episcopal Church who desire to remain in the communion, but only on their terms. And I have to say publicly, that is arrogance. As I said publicly in the House of Bishops, if each of us only wants to be in communion on our terms, we are no better than all of the groups that are broken away, or the host of other splinter groups who, even though they are not in communion with Canterbury, still want to call themselves Anglican. That's just not true. You see, that's an American malaise. Anybody, if they like Calvin, can call themselves Presbyterians if they want to. Or if anybody who believes in you know, believer's baptism can call themselves Methodists, congregational to the core. Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, and Orthodoxy have never affirmed that. We always believe that if you are going to identify yourself by the name of our tradition, you must be united in communion with the head whether that's Antioch, papacy, or whether it's the Archbishop of Canterbury. So you can call yourself actually whatever you like, but actually it is the instruments of unity that define the boundaries and clearly mark out the nature of our identity. Like I said, you can have your opinion about anything that you want, but the fact of the matter is these three communions understand unity as structure, not merely theology. That is one of the places where we are different. So while there are a few bishops in the Episcopal Church who are choosing not to attend Lambeth as an act of protest because gay spouses are not invited, the presiding bishop is calling the bishops of the Episcopal Church to go, and I am looking forward to attending on your behalf. I would never want to end my diocesan address, however, without expressing my gratitude for the team that God has given us. I am grateful to God for Sarah Caprani, who always has a pop tune going on her computer and always makes me look good. I'm also grateful for Archdeacon Alde, who supports me continuously, runs a diaconal training program that is the envy of many, and has just made her ringtone, Drop Kick Me Jesus, through the goalposts of life. <laughs> I'm grateful to God for Canon Justin Holcomb, who is quick thinking, has a tender heart, loves whiskey, always sees the brighter side, and is ever up for the adventure of a new challenge. I am grateful to our Chancellor, Butch Wooten, who is never without resources, who always brings together the best of legal teams for any situation, and whose valuable opinions always start with, you know, it occurs to me. And after that pause, you better be paying attention. Also, thank you to Vice, Vice Chancellor Bill Grimm, who could write the book on constitutional law and church bylaws. Your expertise is a ministry and gift to this diocese. Similar thanks to Wendy Leach, our communications officer, who has continued to up the game in this diocese in terms of our online communication as well as the diocesan paper, which is better than it, is better than it has been in quite a long time. 
I'm also grateful to God for our support staff, Marilyn Lang, Beverly Jennings, who we call the epicenter of St. Cloud, Ellen Seeley, and Eric Perez. We are so grateful to all of them who put in far more hours than their salaries reflect and are willing to pitch in whatever is needed regardless of whether or not it is in their job description. We are more than a list of employees. We enjoy each other's company, we pray together, and above all, we are a diocesan team whose pleasure it is to serve God and what God is doing in the Diocese of Central Florida. As the Bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida, I go into 2020 honestly a very grateful man. I am grateful for the opportunity to be able to serve you. I still just love it. You are a people who deeply love Jesus, who hunger even more deeply for expressions of the kingdom of God. I look forward to our continuing to discern together what it means to be salt and light. I'm overjoyed that I can represent this diocese to the wider church and tell the stories of how God is blessing us with opportunities and challenges that cause us to humbly rise to the occasion, confident in the mercies of God. I am more than grateful that I can say for Laura Lee, a wife who stands beside me as a partner in ministry, is my closest friend and continues to be amazing mother and grandmother. And you need to know that there are places where she's more popular than me. I still remember, I won't tell the church, but I pulled in, Laura Lee couldn't attend. There was a spot, of course, for the bishop. Somebody was standing there to help me with my things. I get out of the car. His first words, not even hello, was, where's your wife? which was fine by me, by the way. I always stand in need of prayer. I thank God that I am ever receiving it. I continue to be blessed and changed by God in this office, more than I could ever deserve. Thank you, as well as God, for an amazing year, and thank you very much for the honor and privilege of serving as your bishop.